Hey there everyone, welcome to day 6 of COM 231. Today we're going to be moving from the ancient tradition to modern context of rhetorical theory. So if you remember our last uh, lecture was on Aristotle and then we sort of sprinted through the entirety of the Western tradition. Today we're going to sort of slow down at the end of that uh, sort of strip. We're going to look at the modern developments, uh, some of the key thinkers specifically one guy, Kenneth Burke, uh, who, aside from Aristotle, is probably the most prominent rhetorical theorist that people in communication studies, at least people who focus on rhetoric, will all acknowledge as a really big figure. And we'll look at a little bit of his work to sort of preload concepts to help us in our discussion and analysis of a documentary that we'll watch on Tuesday. Before we do that, though, uh, as you hopefully already saw in the week two overview video that I sent out on Canvas, our midterm is going to be on Wednesday. So we are going to start wanting to review some of the material that we've gone over the past week. Uh, it primarily is just going to be stuff from last week and from the first half of this week. So it's not a huge amount of material. Uh, if you're concerned about whether or not the final is cumulative, there will maybe be three or four concepts that pop up again on the final, but I'll make sure that I've hit them home again and again, and I'll tell you, like, these are four concepts. Make sure you know them. So it, don't, don't worry too much about that. Uh, so first, uh, make sure that you know who said some of the key quotations that we gave in last week's lectures. So for instance, this first quote, what makes a man a sophist is not his faculty, but his moral purpose. That, of course, is Aristotle in his rhetoric. He's sort of saying, you know, just because someone has the art of persuasion, you can call them a rhetorician. The same for someone who is just seeking to persuade for their own selfish aims. In dialectics, it's different. Someone's either a dialectician or they're not. Either they're interested in, you know, analyzing ideas or they're not. They're just out there for their own selfish purposes. This second one, rhetoric is the art of enchanting the soul, the art of winning the soul by discourse. That's Plato's definition of rhetoric. Remember, Plato was super skeptical of any kind of rhetorical attempt. He, he really just wanted things to be laid out logically, dialectically. He wanted to be able to stand in the street with you. Well, at least from what we glean in the Socratic dialogues, that Socrates should be able to stand there next to you and, you know, have it out, have a deep discussion about you know, justice or virtue or whatever it is that you want to persuade people about. Rhetoric, on the other hand, other hand, of course, is going to be before an audience and, you know, a bunch of assumptions are going to be baked into what you're talking about. Remember that, that term enthymeme? Uh, the difference between a syllogism and an enthymeme is that the enthymeme just builds on common assumptions. There are premises that are sort of clipped away, that are buried, and that aren't going to be explicitly stated. That's super important. Um, and actually, enthymeme isn't on our list on the next slide, but that probably will end up being on the study guide, so make sure that you look through that. This next word here, uh, or not word, this next quote, comes from one of the sophists. He says, There is no truth, or if there is, we cannot know it. Or if we can know it, we can never communicate it to another. This is a radically skeptical philosophical position, and hopefully you remember that it's from Gorgias. We listen to an excerpt of Plato's discourse on Gorgias, uh, where he sort of satirically has Gorgias personified as this grandiose, bombastic orator who thinks that he can, you know, teach anyone pure happiness as a skill if only they pay them. And Socrates, of course, tries to take him down a peg. We listen to, I think, the first 15 minutes of that. Uh, if you don't remember who that's from, that's another one. Make sure you got that down somewhere. Uh, a couple of definitions that we've already talked about. Uh, Paideia, remember that's a system of education. Isocrates, for example, had a, an approach to education. He had a Paideia that, uh, sort of like Plato, saw virtue as an essential part of developing a civic citizen, that you can't just teach oratory, persuasion, you have to teach virtue too. But, but Plato thought you shouldn't accept money for it. Remember, he's got the academy. Uh, which is a little bit different from, so he's he's got a different paideia from Isocrates, we would say. Kairos, this is a, 
a concept that we get from Isocrates. Remember, kairos means the opportune moment. Kairos in, in rhetorical theory is just a way of talking about looking at the, the rhetorical situation is what we'll call it later in the course, but looking at the moment that you're trying to engage in persuasion. So you'll look at things like, who am I speaking to? What, you know, is the political context? What am I trying to persuade them of? And taking in different factors. Syllogism, remember that's the structure of uh, minor premise, major premise, conclusion. The cliche example that you'll hear over and over again is, all people are mortal, Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's the syllogistic structure. It's a part of the dialectic. Uh, enthymeme, good. Okay, so it is on the list. Uh, an enthymeme is that same kind of syllogistic structure, but one of the premises is going to be clipped away. So we would say Socrates is a person, therefore Socrates is mortal. Of course, that assumes that all people are mortal. That example is sort of vanilla, but when it comes to some of the more interesting examples, it's when you can see that people are making all sorts of assumptions in arguments that they're making. Those are enthymemetic, and, and that's going to be really crucial uh, if, if you want to engage in rhetorical analysis or if you're just interested in uh, what it means to be a rhetorician. That's, that's one of the essential building blocks of rhetorical theory. The sophists, we talked about them a whole bunch. They were just people who accepted money to teach others how to persuade audiences, which was super important in ancient Athens. Doxa versus episteme. Remember, doxa is public opinion, which the sophists said you should appeal to, whereas Plato was all about the notion of episteme, about knowledge. Remember, episteme being the root of epistemology, so it, that's the, the study of knowledge. So Plato is all for the idea that there is actual scientific dialectical knowledge that we can get through inquiry. Dialectic, that Again, it's just testing ideas against each other. Remember, we listened to the first part of the Gorgias, and in that you can hear Socrates say, you know, let's have a back and forth. You say something, I'll test whether or not that's true, and then if we have a different conception of things after that, then we'll keep this back and forth going. Let's really try and work through this. And you can even see elements of the scientific method being sort of uh, sowed in that, in that form of discourse. And agon, that comes from Protagoras. Remember, agon, uh, the same root that you see in words like antagonistic, agon being a kind of strife. And so Protagoras, remember, he says, I can make the worst case the better. He thinks that things are all up for debate. It, it, there's nothing that can be settled as absolutely true because you can persuade people of anything because uh, he is a sophist. So uh, agon is his notion that democracy is founded on strife, that there is always in, in inherently some sort of struggle inherent to uh, deliberation, and that's why the sophists saw themselves as providing a key service, because they said, you know, there's always going to be disagreement, so pay us and we'll help you win your argument. Uh, one of the other key things to get down somewhere, if you haven't already, is the analogy that Plato or that Socrates makes to Gorgias in the dialogue that we listen to. Uh, essentially, remember that medicine is to cookery as rhetoric is to justice. So remember, the true arts of health, these are things that actually aim at what is best, kind of like that notion of arte that we talked about, uh, in contrast to uh, techne, just like knacks or crafts that you can contextually engage in, but that actually are kind of... Uh, fallacious in, in Plato's perception. So medicine is to cookery as justice is to rhetoric. That's just an important metaphor that you definitely want to have down somewhere. We already talked about doxa versus episteme, so I'm not, I'm not going to harp on this uh, here, but feel free to look through this slide if you are still on the fence, because I think this little table helps explain some of that. So today we've got a nice uh, video essay that I think does a really great job of connecting things from uh, social, social psychology and modern examples of persuasion. Specifically, the video looks at the world's most wholesome fella, uh, Mr. Rogers, as he makes a plea to uh, a committee on why they should continue to fund uh, children's television services that are aimed at, at, at education. 
Uh, and I think it does a really nice job of, of explaining why persuasion is super important for any kind of uh, educational experience, why it's something that everyone should have some sort of uh, experience with. So we'll, we'll watch that. It's a, it's a little over 20 minutes, but I think it does a really nice job. Some elements of it, uh, you know, we, we could unpack critically, like the, the beginning of the video starts with a Hume quote, and some of the people that are cited have arguments that, you know, we certainly could uh, not necessarily critique, but we could, you know, take apart in, in, in a certain sense. But I think for the most part, the video does a really nice job of getting across some key ideas and making a case for why it's important to understand the outer persuasion. And it does a, a, an analysis of Mr. Rogers' speech and specifically looks at some of the rhetorical appeals that we talked about with Aristotle. So ethos, pathos, and logos, you're going to get to see those in play which I think is really great because it'll show specific quotations and then show you when an appeal to, to character ethos is being made or show when an appeal to emotion pathos is being utilized or when logic and reasoning is being used, logos. So uh, go ahead and pause the video now. Go ahead and click into that uh, video essay. And then once you're finished with that, you can go ahead and resume the lecture here. Cool. Okay, so now that you've watched through the Mr. Rogers video, you should have a pretty clear idea of how the concepts that we've been talking about so far can be transferred from, you know, Aristotle's ancient Athenian context to a modern example. Uh, we'll do a little bit more of that explicitly tomorrow with the documentary, uh, but I thought that was a really nice little flavor, and uh, as a visual learner, I, I am always excited when I find a a video example like that, especially one that I think is so well done. So hopefully you enjoyed that a little bit. If not, I'm sorry. Uh, so today we're going to be documenting a transition in rhetorical theory. So if ancient Athenian culture was, and, and not even just ancient, but, but uh, what we would call pre-modern rhetorical theory, was interested in focusing on how you go about creating a rhetorical artifact, right? So traditionally, it's just been a speech. So even in departments of communication, for the longest time, if you wanted to study rhetoric, you were going to go to the Department of Speech Communication. It wasn't even going to be what we have here at the University of Washington, which is a very interdisciplinary uh, department. You know, we've got interpersonal communication, we've got journalism studies, we have rhetoric, we have, you know, cr critical studies, you know, feminist or, or race theory, queer theory, stuff like that. Uh, but traditionally, you would go to a speech communication depart department, uh, because that's what was the object of study, what we would call the subject of, of rhetoric. So how is it that you can go about creating the most persuasive object, right? in this instance, most traditionally speech. Contemporary rhetorical studies are far more interested in a different kind of subject. So if traditionally rhetoric was seen as a tool to create a rhetorical object, now the idea uh, that's far more common in the study of rhetoric for, you know, for rhetoricians in academia is what we would call constitutive rhetoric, like a, like something that constitutes, right? Constitutive rhetoric. What does that mean? Well, uh, I'll talk through that in the next couple slides. Um, I didn't exactly read through this text here, but if you didn't understand what I just said, maybe it'll make it a little clearer. So let's look at it, the two different art artifacts. So first we'll look at the Mona Lisa, and then we'll look at another painting called La Meninas. And I think it'll hopefully explain part of what, what we're getting at with this transition and this, the change in the subject of rhetoric. The Mona, Lisa is, uh, the Mona Lisa is often praised for the technical expertise that went into making it, or you know what art critics would say is a kind of technical expertise. The same would be said of traditional rhetorical studies, that they're more interested in the expertise that go into crafting the ideal rhetorical artifact. So here at the very bottom, you can see a little diagram. You are making something here, how you produce an ideal form. 
That's, that's the traditional rhetorical approach. Uh, instead, we have a transition in subject. So th this is a super famous painting uh, in art criticism. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, it's by Diego uh, Velasquez. It's called La Meninas. You might think initially that the subject of the painting is this little girl right here. And, you know, she's surrounded by a bunch of other people, so she's probably pretty important. But then uh, upon closer analysis, you can actually see that they're all looking at you. There's, there's even a painter here painting you. Well, who are you in this instance? Well, actually, there's, there's a little mirror in the very back. And you can actually see that you, that all the eyes that are looking in your direction, you are inhabiting the space of this king and queen back here in this little mirror. Uh, the, the French philosopher Michel Foucault does a, a reading of this painting. Um, and there's another famous cultural theorist, Stuart Hall, from the UK, who does a really nice job of summarizing Foucault's reading. So I've excerpted a nice little three-page clip from an article that I think it's, it's, it's pretty accessible. It's, it's, you know, theoretical, but it's written in a, in a nice, clear way. Uh, so go ahead and pause the video and uh, work through that excerpt. It's not very long because you're going to want to answer these questions uh, in the discussion post. What are the two centers or subjects of the painting? And then what's the significance of the mirror in the back of the painting? We've talked through it a little bit, but uh, you, I'll, for like a comprehension check, essentially, I'll want you to, to explain those concepts. So if traditional approaches were interested in how you produce this ideal form, Modern, or what might even be called postmodern, although again, contemporary culture is moving in different directions from that necessarily, but the studies and thinkers that we have would fall into either of those categories, uh, are more interested in how different artifacts produce a notion of you, how different artifacts constitute you, how you are constituted by different persuasive artifacts. So that's why we would call it constitutive rhetoric. So this is going to be something that you'll need to explain or work through on the midterm. So make sure you, you understand that there's a crucial transition that's, that's happened here. We're less interested in studying the artifacts themselves and more interested in, in studying how existing persuasive artifacts can constitute uh, identities. So, so uh, you know, this is far more interested in notions of identity. So uh, that, that's a super important transition and study to mark. Another important development is that with modern society comes mass society, right? Comes large groups of people coming together with new media, new technologies, and new ways of communicating. So that there are wholly distinct ways that people are networked in what we would call modern society that we didn't have in ancient Athens. Uh, a super important figure in this development is a guy named Edward Bernays. So Edward Bernays is sort of often called the father of public relations. So not only did he help develop public, public relations in the sense of, you know, marketing campaigns, so what we know of as brands today owe a whole lot to Edward, Edward Bernays, but he's also often cited as one of the key people who instantiated the modern idea of a presidential campaign, that a president should approach uh, the democratic population and think of themselves as a kind of product. Think of their their term that they're trying to, you know, earn the vote for from, from people in, in the society as a kind of product. They should try and brand themselves. So he's, he's even got a book that's super famous called Propaganda. And it's not necessarily meant in the kind of pejorative sense that we mean it today it, it more so is i mean it's still kind of manipulative right but it's it's ambiguous so it's still getting at an argument that 
mass publics need to be controlled in democratic societies, which is, is a controversial argument, to say the least. Uh, and we can even see the importance of this today when we look at something like the 2008 presidential campaign. Uh, the, the award for the best advertisement, the industry award, comes from a publication called Ad Age. The winner of the industry award for advertisements in 2008 wasn't, you know, a Tide commercial or, well, actually, Apple was in the running, uh, the maker of everyone's phone. But actually, the winner was Barack Obama's presidential campaign. They said, you did the best job of branding. They, they saw the Obama Hope campaign as a brand, as a, as a product. Uh, so we still see this, this sort of public relations arm of persuasion active in modern society. And, you know, if you flip on any television, most of us have streaming services now, but <laughs> if you go to your parents and they pay for cable, who knows why, you're probably going to see that 75% of what you're watching is advertisements. And if you took a, a English 101 class, probably at some point they made you deconstruct an advertisement from Calvin Klein. Uh, so th this stuff is all super pervasive today. We take it for granted, um, but this stuff all is, is, is part to, uh, partly thanks to Edward Bernays and his work. Here's another example of this intersection between what we were talking about with the Las Meninas painting with this notion of constitutive rhetoric and this this idea of propaganda right um, so obviously this is what anyone sees in their you know American history class as the traditional form of, of military propaganda uh, but here we can even see the, the, a super explicit example of that notion of constitutive rhetoric right who is the you in the Uncle Sam picture of course, it's super cliche, but th this is this is the notion of the transition, right? Of of what modern or postmodern rhetorical scholars are going to be more interested in is how is how is a notion of identity among a nation, among a subgroup, among a culture? How is it how is it created? How is it cultivated? Sustained? How is it changed? Uh, all of these are going to be objects of study in you know, our current Department of Communication among rhetorical scholars. Uh, and these, these cultural artifacts get at a part of that notion. For your discussion post today, what I'm gonna ask you to do is pull out two key concepts from the bolded vocabulary in the first chapter of Rhetoric and Civic Life on, on uh, symbolic action uh, that you thought were interesting and worth exploring a little bit more provide the definitions for your peers just so it can kind of serve as a study guide in and of itself. You can sort of look back at this discussion board and see the definitions that other people pulled out. Uh, and then once you've pulled out definitions, just explain why you found them interesting. You could pull in, uh, you know, a contemporary cultural example or personal experience or it, really anything that explains a little bit more about the concept as you understand it. Uh, the only thing I'll say is that you probably noticed that they did, you know, set aside about two paragraphs or so to brush through really quickly the ancient roots of the rhetoric that we talked about for the first week. I wanted to set aside a little more time because I think the debate between Plato and the Sophists is really important. But you might have also noticed that the, the authors of the book pretty explicitly side with the Sophists and they acknowledge that there's a large current in contemporary rhetorical scholarship that also sides with the sophists. That is the case, although I think it's sort of changing a little bit. And, you know, I'm not a tenured professor, so as a graduate student, I'm a little more interested in the newer conversations that are happening. Although probably in 15 years, I'll stop giving a crap and, you know, also just say the same stuff over and over again. But one thing that we see developing is a reevaluation of the debate between Plato and the Sophists. So that's what I wanted to explain a little bit more. So if if you were a little bit confused or you were intrigued by how they characterize that debate, uh, hopefully you have more context now that we've talked about uh, the the disagreements that happen and the different approaches to conceptualizing rhetoric. Uh, so that's just a, a super brief aside on that. Uh, awesome. Okay. 
So next lesson on Tuesday is going to be a documentary, and I'll do a little bit of a discussion on Kenneth Burke. I, I was initially going to do that for today's lesson, but I think it might be better to, to begin our analysis of the documentary with those concepts fresh in our mind. So I'm actually going to save that material for Tuesday. Uh, I look forward to reading your discussion posts as always. Don't, don't feel scared to come to office hours. I know it's remote, so things are, you know, strange and it might feel weird to show up, but please, I, I would love to make this class feel a little more personal. And if multiple people come in and they're comfortable, you know, sharing their questions, I think that would be really cool. So but please feel free to stop by office hours. Uh, otherwise, I'm excited to read what you have to say on the constitutive turn in rhetorical theory and the uh, definitions that we read through in this first chapter. Awesome. Take care.